Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's live presentation titled Organized Technology from Adult Stem Cells to Miniature Organs. My name is Mark Kennedy, and I'm from Thermo Fisher Scientific, and I'll be your moderator. Uh, before we begin, I, I do want to point out that you can submit questions at any time by typing them into the Q&A box, which can be found in the lower left of the presentation window. We'll answer as many questions as we can following the presentation. So with that housekeeping, it is now my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Helmuth Gehart. Dr. Gehart received his PhD from ETH Zurich in Switzerland in 2013. During his PhD training with Professor Romeo Ricci, Helmuth studied the mechanisms behind type 2 diabetes and the complex cellular checkpoints that maintain balance to prevent disease. Thereafter, Helmuth aimed to combine his knowledge of signaling and metabolism with the fascinating field of stem cell biology. Thus, he joined the group of Professor Hans Klevers at the Hubrecht Institute. There, he investigates adult tissue stem cells of the liver and their use in clinical research and regenerative medicine. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Gerhardt. Thank you very much, Mark, for this very nice introduction. So indeed, today we're going to talk of, about organoid technology and basically how can we turn an adult stem cell into a miniature organ and what can we use these for. So when we talk about stem cells or stem cell applications, usually people think about one of three systems. There are embryonic stem cells, uh, IPS cells, and of course, adult stem cells. Now, each of these systems has its individual advantages and disadvantages. To um, just summarize some of those, embryonic stem cells, for example, are highly expandable. That is, of course, very interesting also for regenerative medicine where you uh, want to have enough tissue to transplant. And they are pluripotent. On the one hand, that is a good thing because um, you can basically make any tissue from these cells. But there is a certain dark side to pluripotency, and that is a tumor risk. Because when you, for example, transplant these cells and you cannot make sure that all of these cells are properly differentiated, um, you run the risk of creating a teratoma in your patient. Um, other concerns of embryonic stem cells are genetic stability. They are actually uh, known to have uh, relatively common chromosomal rearrangements. And last but certainly not least, there are significant ethical concerns with derivation of these lines. Now, at least these ethical concerns have been uh, successfully overcome by the uh, creation of IPS cells. Like the embryonic stem cells, they are highly expandable, pluripotent, and they can actually be generated from adult cells. And that is, of course, a big advantage. The downside is, well, they are still pluripotent, which means um, that also there is a certain tumor risk uh, still present. They tend to acquire um, a relatively high number of mutations in culture, and very often, um, there are still viral vectors being used to introduce these so-called Yamanaka factors into the cells. Although I have to say that um, there are more and more technologies evolving that actually uh, make the use of viral vectors obsolete. So the third um, technology here would be adult stem cells. Now, in contrast to the uh, first two, adult stem cells are not pluripotent. They are multipotent. And that means that they can make um, different cell types. However, they are limited to uh, differentiating into cell types of the tissue that this stem cell is actually coming from. So an intestinal stem cell will make intestinal cells. A liver stem cell will make liver cells. Um, for this reason, there is a significantly reduced uh, tumor risk in these cells because they just cannot... Um, basically de-differentiate that far. And they have what I call a short differentiation distance. And what I mean by that is that in, for an in ES cell, you have basically go through the complete embryonic development to end up with a mature functional cell. For an adult tissue stem cell, 
you are basically only two or three steps away from actually turning the cell into a mature functional cell. Of course, there are also negative sides of adult stem cells. That is, isolation is invasive. So if you want an uh, intestinal stem cell, well, you need a piece of intestine. If you want a pancreas stem cell, you need a piece of pancreas. So basically, it involves a surgical procedure. And the other uh, downside that existed for a very long time was there was no way to actually expand these cells in vitro. And this is what actually changed with the um, development of organoid technology. So before we talk about organoids, um, let's talk more about adult stem cells. So in the Clavers group, when we uh, think about an adult stem cell, we usually default to the intestinal epithelium because the intestinal epithelium is just such a beautiful system to um, study adult stem cells. So this tissue turns over extremely quickly. So every four to five days, all the uh, cells in your intestinal epithelium renew. And that happens uh, in a way that new cells are constantly being generated in structures called crypts. These are, uh, yeah, well, these crypt-like structures that are embedded in the intestinal wall. And these crypts contain stem cells. And these stem cells uh, divide continuously and more mature cells are being pushed upwards onto the villus, so this uh, structure that protrudes into the intestinal lumen is called the villus. And while these cells uh, move from the crypt to the villus, they undergo maturation um, until they die when they reach the top of the villus. So in this tissue, we have extremely active stem cells. In fact, they divide every day, um, but nevertheless, they, uh, maintain, they are maintained for your lifetime. And that was, in the beginning, quite, um, I would say, a revolutionary finding, because until then, um, at tissue stem cells were always thought to be uh, quiescent, very rarely dividing to protect their genome. But it turns out in many tissues, this is actually not the case. While well, they're still protecting the genome, but um, they do divide very, very uh, frequently. Now, the identification of these intestinal stem cells was made possible by the work of Nick Barker um, in 2007. And what he did is that he developed um, an LGR5 knock-in mouse, and this was a reporter knock-in mouse. And what he found is that it marked a certain population of cells at the very uh, bottom of the crypt. Uh, you can see this here on the right side. And it turned out that these cells are indeed the intestinal stem cells. So they are nestled between um, another cell type, the so-called PANF cells. They are much bigger, wedge-shaped cells. And they basically provide the uh, stem cell niche for the actual stem cells and uh, protect them from uh, infection, for example. So um, how can we actually prove that this uh, cell at the bottom of the crypt is the actual stem cell? Well, the best way to do that is lineage tracing. So to do lineage tracing, we need two components. On the one hand, we need um, a a recombinase, a Cree recombinase in this case, that is specifically um, expressed in the cells that are our putative stem cells. So in this case, it would be a uh, Cree ERT2 that is expressed under the LGF5 promoter. So what that means is when um, a mouse receives tamoxifen, this Cree is activated, can go into the nucleus, and can then uh, recombine LOX P sites. So these LOX P sites, this is the other component of the system, are around a transcriptional stop signal that prevents uh, LUX Z from being transcribed. And so when this recombi recombination happens in a cell, LUX Z can be expressed and this, the cell will appear blue in the staining. And not only the cell that expresses LGF5, but also all cells that are actually derived from this cell. So all offspring from these cells will be marked by LGF5. 
So what we would expect is if we are indeed able to mark a stem cell, then we should see um, ribbons of cells going up the crypt villus axis because we know this is how the epithelium in the intestine is moving. And in that, indeed, when Nick did his experiments, and you can see this here, these are three time points. In the very beginning, and there are only few cells marked. These are the, the actual stem cells in the crypts. And the longer he waits, I think this is like three days and then uh, one or two weeks, you can see that this, this ribbon of cells is moving uh, uh, up the, the, the side of the villus out of the crypt. And the interesting thing is, this was not just a short time labeling, but even a year or in two, even two years, if the mouse lives that long afterwards, you can still find the same ribbons, which means the cells are not only continuously dividing, but they are also maintained over the lifetime of an animal. So the other question here would be then, so do indeed all the intestinal epithelial cells come from the stem cells? In this picture, we can already see there are clearly enterocytes being marked, but also the other cell types of the intestinal epithelium you can see here on the left, goblet cells, uh, in the middle, PANF cells, on the right side, enteroendocrine cells are equally uh, blue, so indeed are derived from this uh, stem cells. So that was, in principle, the proof that these LGR5 uh, cells are indeed the intestinal stem cells. Now we can do a little bit more sophisticated way of uh, lineage tracing um, these stem cells that allows us to look at individual stem cell clones, if you want. And this is um, the so-called confetti system. Again, we have a Cree recombinase under the LGF5 promoter, but we have a different reporter construct here. So without a Cree activity, there is no a color expression. However, uh, when the Cree uh, recomb recombination happens, there are four different possibilities how this construct can recombine. And that can give us either a green cell, a yellow cell, a red cell, or a blue cell. And that allows us to look at um, the behavior of individual clones within a crypt. So here you can see a schematic uh, depiction of the crypt. We have in the beginning the stem cells marked in different colors, and they produce offspring in different colors. But what you can see here is that over time, there is one color that becomes um, predominant in the crypt. So that after um, a few weeks, basically, the crypt expresses only a single color. And you may think that this artistic depiction here is a little bit exaggerated, but if we look at the actual data, it is very, very close. And what we could learn from that is that um, intestinal crypts become clonal over time, and this is due to an effect that is called neutral drift. So intestinal stem cells divide symmetrically, which means after the division, both daughter cells have equal potential to either stay a stem cell or a differentiate. But what they are doing, they are competing for available niche space at the bottom of the crypt. So in fact, they are competing for contact with PANF cells. So just by chance, over time, one clone in a crypt becomes uh, dominant. Now, LGF5 marks these intestinal stem cells, but how does it look in other tissues? Well, when we uh, look at other uh, relatively fast proliferating tissues, like, for example, the colon here, you can see that we see very similar structures. There's no villus in the colon. However, we also have crypts, and also at the bottom of the crypt, we can see LGF5 positive stem cells. And the same is true in the stomach. The uh, architecture there is a little bit different, but also the stomach is, uh, has clearly LGF5 positive stem cells. And even when we look in the skin, in the hair follicle, we can clearly uh, detect a population of stem cells that is positive for LGF5. Um, now, all of these are tissues that turn over relatively quickly, but how, how is it in tissues that um, have a relatively low turnover, let's say the liver or the pancreas? Well, when we induce um, regeneration in these tissues, for example, by inducing damage, in fact, we do see cells coming up that express LGF5. And here on the left, uh, you see the pancreas before and after partial duct ligation, 
and then indeed we can see cells that express LGL5. On the right side there is the liver and also there after treatment of mice with uh, carbon tetrachloride you can see that uh, suddenly uh, we can see LGL5 positive cells in the tissue. Again, um, we can do lineage tracing also in these tissues and when we do that, so on the top you see the colon, you see there's beautiful trace tracing there and uh, after uh, a few weeks basically the entire crypt is uh, marked. The same is true in the stomach and even in the hair follicle you can see uh, widespread lineage tracing from LGF5 positive cells. So what is this magical uh, protein LGR5? Well, it is very tightly uh, connected to wind signaling. And uh, wind signaling is one of the most important, if not the most important, uh, signaling pathway in the intestinal epithelium. So basically, in the absence of uh, wind ligands, uh, beta-catenin, is continuously destroyed by the destruction complex. And that means it cannot go into the nucleus and cannot interact with TCF, which is inhibited by um, another protein called Groucho. When a wind ligand binds to its receptor frizzled and the co-receptor LRP, the destruction complex is inhibited. Beta-catenin can um, accumulate and uh, translocate to the nucleus where it then binds to TCF and induces the transcription of wind target genes. Now, there are two extreme cases that uh, illustrate the importance of this pathway for the intestinal epithelium. One would be um, constitutive lock, loss of wind signaling, and this can be achieved, for example, by knocking out TCF4. Then, no matter where, whether there is wind ligand or not, you will not get um, a transcriptional response. And uh, when TCF4 is knocked out in the intestinal epithelium, again, you can see a time course here on the, on the lower part of the slide. Um, on the left side, you can see with the KS67 staining, uh, before a deletion of TCF4, there are high levels of proliferation in the crypts. However, already three days after deletion, you can see that this proliferation is greatly reduced. And when we look seven days after the deletion, you can actually see that the intestinal epithelium is completely collapsing and um, well, the mice do not survive much longer than that. So clearly, wind signaling is an essential component of uh, the intestinal structure and intestinal proliferation. The other extreme would be not a loss of wind signaling, but actually constitutive activation of wind signaling. And this can be achieved, for example, by mutating APC. This is one component of the destruction complex. So no matter whether there is wind ligand or not, uh, wind target genes are always expressed. So there is um, a group of patients that have uh, inherited uh, mutations in APC and um, they have a syndrome called familial adenomatous polyposis, or FAP. And what is happening in these patients is that they develop hundreds, if not thousands, of adenomas in their intestine. So you can see here, this is a picture of a colon from um, a patient. The colon would normally be completely smooth, but you can see every little um, knob that you can see here is actually an adenoma that has formed as a result of the continuously active wind signaling in these patients. So clearly, this pathway has an extremely important role in um, controlling wind signaling, uh, in controlling the intestinal epithelium. So what does LGF5 actually do? Um, LGF5 itself is a wind target gene. So uh, when there's wind signaling, LGF5 is upregulated. It's a member of the G protein coupled receptor family, and very importantly, um, our spondins have been identified as ligands of LGF4, LGF5, and LGF6. Our spondin, um, already before it was known to bind to LGF5, was known to have a potentiating effect on wind signaling. For a long time, it was not clear how this is actually working, but um, 
work in our lab and, and uh, work in the lab of Feng Kong and others has helped to um, clarify uh, what is actually happening. So here you see frizzled, you see the co-receptor LRP, LRP5, and you see LGR4 or 5. Normally, when wind binds to these um, receptors, you get activation of the cascade, uh, the catenin goes in the nucleus, and you get expression of wind target genes. Two of these wind target genes are RNA43 and ZNRF3. And these are actually E3 ligases that can bind to the frizzled complex, ubiquitinate it, and lead to its um, destruction. So in the end, this is a feedback loop that um, switches wind signaling off as soon as it gets activated. Now, when arspondin is around, uh, arspondin can bind to LGR5 or LGR4, and it, with the other uh, domain, it can actually bind to RNA43 or ZNRF3. It can sequester those away, um, which basically leaves the activated frizzled LRP complex on the surface uh, intact and allows for continuous wind signaling. And this continuous wind signaling is actually necessary to maintain stem cells. So how do we get to organoids? Well, in 2009, uh, Toshiro Sato in the Clavers lab decided he uh, wanted to try to culture these intestinal stem cells in vitro. And to do that, he basically took uh, Nick's LGF5 GFB mouse, he sorted out the GFB high cells, and he embedded them in matrigel. On top of that, he added a relatively simple growth medium it uh, basically contains epidermal growth factor, EGF, noggin, which is a BMP inhibitor, and respondin 1, as I mentioned before, which is a wind potentiator. And in fact, this uh, medium is basically mimics the contribution that would usually come from the mesenchymal niche around the intestinal crypt. And when he did that, what he could observe is that single stem cells grew uh, in the course of one or two weeks into these fairly complex structures that you can see here. And at the first glance, it may look um, chaotic, but if you have a closer look, you will see that um, these organoids or mini guts resemble the um, epithelium in vivo actually almost perfectly. So for example, when we um, have a look here at the organoid, we can distinguish both crypt domains, these are these protruding domains, and we can distinguish villus domains. So of course the organoid doesn't have a villus, but the, the rounded body of the organoid would, be cor would correspond to, to the villus domain. In the crypt, we find, like in the uh, primary tissue, LGR5 positive stem cells, and you can even see here in this panel F that they are interspersed with PANF cells. These are these bigger cells in between the LGR5 positive cells. So they are rebuilding the niche in vitro. Then uh, you can see on the KS67 staining that proliferation is indeed happening just in the crypts, not in the body of the organoid. And in the body, we will actually find more mature cells, um, different cell types, and eventually these cells after four or five days, like they do in, vi in, vi in vivo, will die um, until the organoid basically bursts open and releases um, the dead cells that accumulate in the lumen in the middle. So structurally, it already looks uh, like the intestinal epithelium, but can we actually find the different cell types there? And the answer is yes. So uh, we can for sure find here mature enterocytes. Uh, they are marked here by villain. Uh, we can find goblet cells marked by mucin 2. We find PANF cells in these script like structures marked by lysozyme. And we can find enteroendocrine cells here marked by chromogranin A. So, indeed, um, these mini guts uh, r resemble the uh, epithelium in vivo in an uh, extremely um, comparable way. The important to mention here, these are purely epithelial cultures. So there is no mesenchyme there because, as I mentioned before, 
the factors that would usually be contributed by the mesenchyme are actually contributed by the medium. So that was the intestine. But can we actually do organoids from other tissues as well? Um, the answer is yes. So you can see four examples here. There are actually by now way more. So there are pancreas organoids, mouse pancreas organoids, mouse prostate organoids, and mouse liver organoids. And um, while they do differ in their medium requirements slightly, they all have in common that they need respondin. Um, they need usually some form of BMP inhibition and um, usually AGF. Uh, then it can be that you have to add a tissue-specific hormone, a tissue-specific growth factor to, to actually get them to grow. What you can see as well is that structurally these organoids are quite different. Now, um, having different uh, tissue organoids in a mouse was, of course, one important step. But more importantly would be to have organoids from humans. So that was um, a logical next step. And indeed, by now, we can grow um, organoids from many, many epithelial tissues. So we have established cultures for lung, liver, colon, breast, stomach, pancreas, small intestine, and prostate by now. And you can see here some human organoids, again, structurally very different. Uh, generally, uh, human organoids need slightly more complex media than uh, mouse organoids. Uh, very often, like the TGF beta inhibitors um, or uh, ex extra hormones that need to be added, uh, often some CAMP uh, stimulating factors. So, usually, the culture is a little bit more demanding, but uh, still very similar to what was originally established in the mouse. So, all these different organoid systems, what, what do they actually have in common? What, what does define uh, what an organoid is? Well, a very important feature is all of them are untransformed. So they are grown usually from small biopsies, just put into, into the medium, and they, they will grow out. There is no need to add any uh, plasmids, any uh, factors that would transform them. They are three-dimensional. They grow in matrigel and they have um, a realistic microanatomy. They are highly proliferative and expandable. That is for certain applications like bigger screens or regenerative medicine, of course, very important. And they can recapitulate functions of the parent tissue. So um, as, you, as you've seen, intestinal organoids uh, produce all different cells, and these cells then secrete different hormones, for example, the enteroendocrine cells. Or, um, a, a liver organoid can be differentiated to make um, hepatocytes, and these hepatocytes then produce albumin, have cytochrome activities, and so forth. And the last point that is also very important is the organoids actually display a very high genetic stability in culture. So uh, stability that is, in fact, comparable to um, a cell in our body. Good. So what can we actually do with these organoids? So there are mostly four different, I would say, groups of applications for organoids. The first one would be uh, disease modeling, mostly on the one hand infectious diseases, but then also genetic diseases, of course, are very interesting to study in organoids. Um, second would be pharma pharmacological screens that can be, on the one hand, drug discovery, but on the other hand, it can also be personalized medicine to basically match a patient with the ideal drug that will actually help him. Uh, third, certainly regenerative medicine. Um, the expandability, the genetic stability, and so forth makes it very attractive for this application. And then last but certainly not least, cancer research, because when we can grow an organoid from healthy tissue, we usually can also grow organoids from the associated tumors. So let's start with some examples of disease modeling. Um, these are human gastric organoids uh, that you see here. Again, they grow from single cells into organoids, and they have this uh, structure similar to intestinal organoids, but not exactly the same. We can find um, 
almost all cell types of the stomach epithelium in these organoids. Um, there's actually one exception, and uh, you can see this in the middle on the right. Um, we still do not get uh, parietal cells. We're actually now working on that. We made some progress there, but at least in the uh, protocol that is published so far, you will not get parietal cells. And these are the cells that would uh, normally cause the, the acidification um, of uh, the stomach. Nevertheless, everything else is there. So um, we have an, an stomach epithelium that um, can be used for, uh, for example, study the interaction with a pathogen. So this is um, exactly what uh, Sina Bartfeld did. So she took Helicobacter pylori, one of the most common <clears throat> pathogens associated with the stomach, injected it into the organoids because um, the the apical side of the organoid is inside, and you can see in the middle here um, the helicobacter being labeled with a GFP, and on the right side you can see an uh, electron microscopy image, and you can, be, uh, you can uh, see how the bacterium basically burrows into the, the epithelium of the cell and, and, and directly interacts with that. And this is, of course, an interesting model to study. For example, how can I prevent this interaction? Um, how can I manipulate it? But also, how does the epithelium actually react to this uh, infection with Helicobacter? And um, just here as a small proof of principle, what um, Sina has done is she compared um, gastric organoids before and after um, infection with Helicobacter. And you can see that, for example, IL-8 mRNA is going up extremely quickly already two hours after infection. You see a uh, high level of expression there, and then it goes down, down over time. And in fact, this is the same as what can be observed uh, in vivo. So another um, example, actually two examples for disease modeling in organoids comes from the liver. So these are human liver organoids. They are grown like from a small biopsy. We can isolate stem cells, and these uh, grow then very fast, have a very high expansion rate. In fact, in like three or four months, you could grow the equivalent of a complete human liver just in cell number from um, a single stem cell. And um, yeah, so when liver organoids grow, they actually grow as bipotential progenitors. So without differentiation, you will find very few cells that are actually differentiated to either hepatocytes or bilayer cells. But what you can do is by changing the medium conditions, you can uh, turn them either into hepatocytes or bilayer cells. And uh, you can see one example here. So this is differentiation to the hepatocyte fate. And then we see expression of albumin and a strong induction of cytochrome 3 or 4, for example. So um, the first example for disease modeling here would be alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. So this is a genetic disease with um, a mutation in alpha-1 antitrypsin. And this mutation causes the protein to misfold and to accumulate in hepatocytes, uh, which means it cannot be secreted anymore. And that is fairly problematic because um, alpha-1 antitrypsin is important in um, neutralizing the uh, activity of neutrophil uh, elastase. So if you do not have enough alpha-1 antitrypsin in your system, in your circulation, because it is clogged up in hepatocytes, um, you are basically slowly digesting your own tissue. And that is especially problematic for the lungs, for example. So um, on the top uh, panel, on the, on, on, on the left, you can see liver tissue, both from a healthy donor and from a patient with alpha-1 antitrypsin. And there you can see this typical um, accumulation of alpha-1 antitrypsin in hepatocytes. And when you look at the lower two pictures, these are from organoids. You can see on the left side, uh, this is from the healthy donor again. You cannot see any aggregates there, but on the right side of the patient, you can find the same alpha-1 antitrypsin aggregates inside um, the cells of the differentiated organoids. Then also when you look at uh, secretion, for example, you can see reduced levels of alpha-1 antitrypsin secretion in the patient samples. 
and also the ability of supernatants from these organoids to in, in, uh, inhibit and LSAs are uh, greatly reduced. So the other example of disease modeling is actually not an hepatocyte disease, but is a biliary disease, and so-called allergic syndrome. And this is usually a mutation in JAK1, sometimes also a mutation in NOTCH2. So it basically affects the NOTCH pathway. And what happens is that these patients uh, fail to build a proper biliary tree. So the cells, um, the biliary cells cannot connect properly, so bile cannot flow from the liver, um, yeah, which of course leads to cholestasis and all kinds of um, problems and liver damage. So here these organoids have been differentiated to the biliary fate, and you can see the biliary cells marked by and keratin-19. In case of the healthy wild type donor, you can see that the biliary cells are nicely integrated into the organoid epithelium. However, with the patients, you find these cells rounded up in uh, the, the lumen of the organoid. They are positive for cleaves caspase 3, so they are basically undergoing apoptosis. And this is very similar to what is actually happening uh, in the patient. So you can Imagine that this is a very interesting platform to, for example, develop a drug that can prevent this from happening. Now, the um, fourth example for disease modeling, and probably the most advanced one that I want to show you, is uh, cystic fibrosis. Now, cystic fibrosis is caused by a mutation in the chloride channel CFDR, and it affects uh, several organs of course, the intestine, the pancreas, the lung, the liver, but usually the most apparent effect is in the lungs. So CFDR controls how much water is being um, secreted, and that, again, controls the consistency of the mucus on top of the epithelium in the lung. If CFDR is defective, this mucus is too thick, it cannot move properly, um, the patients cannot get rid of bacteria there, have uh, problems breathing due to this very thick mucus, and, um, well, yeah, uh, have, uh, of course, a very significantly affected uh, life quality because of that. Now, the issue is that uh, there are more than 2,000 different CFDR mutations. And depending on what mutation you have, you will respond differently to different drugs. And even two patients that have the same mutation um, often do not respond in the same way to the same drug. So there is certainly um, a need to have a, a system that allows us to find out which drug can actually work for which patient. So together with the group of Jeffrey Bakeman, um, we in the Clavers lab developed uh, this fairly simple assay. So what we are doing here is we can isolate uh, organoids from a small a biopsy from the rectum, actually, that is not uh, invasive and is uh, fairly easy to do. We can grow them. And then um, we can basically add a CMP agonist to these organoids. So that can be forscolin, that could be cholera toxin, and what happens then is that a healthy organoid will start to swell. And this is what you can see on the left side here. Now, this swelling uh, depends on CFDR. So if CFDR is not functional, there's actually no swelling. And this is what you can see on the right side uh, with the organoids of a cystic fibrosis patient. So this is a very simple, uh, very robust assay. So, and this is where at drug screening comes in now. So uh, this, was, uh, this was a study that was done for, for two drugs that were developed by Vertex, and they were specifically developed for the F508 uh, mutation. This is one of the most common uh, mutations in cystic fibrosis. Obviously, drug companies have interest to develop uh, drugs for large patient populations. So what you can see, the upper row is T0, this is before the addition of forskolin, the lower row is T60, and you can see in the control the 
um, patient organoids are basically not swelling at all, and on the very right side, the healthy control swells beautifully. Now, when we add one of the drugs, either VX809 or VX770, you can see there's a partial rescue. There is uh, some swelling happening, but when you combine both of them, you can see that uh, the, the swelling is basically indistinguishable from the wild-type organoids. So that is an, a very nice proof of concept to show that you can successfully test a drug in, uh, in organoids in vitro. Now, um, actually, we are trying to go even further with that now. So I told you that, that there are more than 2,000 different CFDR mutations. And that means, unfortunately, that if you have a, a rare uh, mutation that causes cystic fibrosis, there's a very high likelihood that there will never be a clinical test uh, or a clinical trial that will test which drug actually works for your specific case. And there was uh, one fairly famous case here in the Netherlands of a a uh, young boy that had um, a very rare mutation. He actually only shared that with his aunt and um, was doing fairly badly. And uh, indeed, organoids were isolated from him and different drugs were tested. And surprisingly, it turned out that these organoids reacted very well to one of these uh, Vortex drugs. So indeed, he received this drug in the end and he got immediately better. So that is, I think, a very uh, impressive example that was also all over the news here. And in the end, it led to the um, Dutch healthcare system to actually pay for more than 500 cystic fibrosis patients to be tested um, here with an organoid assay to see which drugs uh, work for them. Um, of course, the healthcare providers have also their own interest in mind here because as I told you before, um, even if you have the same mutation, there's sometimes only a 50% chance that a certain drug will work for you, and um, they would like to have a good system to figure out um, basically for which patients they do not need to pay for the drugs anymore. Well, but um, yeah, so this is a, a, a system that is being established here on a large scale now, and in the end, um, we hope that the majority of the like 1,500 cystic fibrosis patients in the Netherlands will be um, tested with an organoid assay for which drug can work best for them. So that brings us to the next application, and that would be regenerative medicine. Well, regenerative medicine um, is not yet as advanced, I would say, as some of the other applications, but we have already some um, good pilot data here to kind of show the potential of the technology. So this is work that was done um, with the lab of Mamoru Watanabe in Japan. So basically here we uh, sorted out colon stem cells, red colon stem cells, expanded them, shipped them to, to Japan. And what the Watanabe lab established is a model um, where you can induce damage in the colon and then basically infuse the organoids into the damaged colons. The organoids will home to the damaged regions and will actually repopulate the epithelium there. And this is what you can see here. Um, this is 25 weeks after the transplantation. You have these large red areas where the organoids actually engrafted. And when you look at histology, uh, you can see how um, the uh, colon epithelium was perfectly rebuilt um, by the organoids that um, engrafted there. Now, this was just mouse-to-mouse -mouse transplantation. Of course, we would like um, to uh, go also in human transplantation, or at least human-to-mouse first. Um, a first example for that is here, this is liver, and uh, the transplantation of human liver organoids in damaged mouse livers. So this is a model of acute liver damage with CCL4 and retrosin. And when we damage the liver, then inject the organoids, we can actually see that we do get engraftment of organoid cells. Uh, the majority of cases, it is uh, just individual cells that engraft in the tissue, spread throughout the tissue, but sometimes you can also see larger areas of um, transplanted cells. So this is an, I would say, important proof of concept. I have to say that the efficiency 
uh, of the process is not where we want it to be yet, then we are actively working on um, getting much better uh, engraftment efficiencies here to bring the system eventually to the human. Now, another important factor for regenerative medicine is also how uh, easy is it to use the system for uh, genome editing. And uh, this is one example here. So we are uh, going back to cystic fibrosis here. So this was work done by uh, Gerhard Schwank. And what he did is he um, took organoids from a patient with cystic fibrosis, as shown before, they cannot uh, swell when uh, phoscholine, for example, is added. And he uh, took these organoids and he used the CRISPR-Cas9 system to actually um, repair the mutation that causes the defect in CFTR. So he cut close to the mutation with uh, CRISPR-Cas9. He provided a recombination template with um, the corrected mutation. He selected the cells that had correctly um, integrated this construct and then expanded them and actually tested them. And when you look at the actual data, here you can see on the left side, these were the organoids before and the gene was repaired. And on the right side, these were the organoids after the gene was successfully repaired. You can see the swelling is perfectly restored. So this is an important proof of concept that uh, genome editing can be done in organoids. And of course, that leads to an, uh, the possibility that we can, can combine these technologies. We have a patient with a genetic defect, let's say a genetic liver defect. We isolate stem cells from these patients. We use CRISPR-Cas9 to repair the mutation. We expand the repaired tissue and transplant it back to the patient. That would be, of course, the goal. So that brings me to um, the last point here, and that is cancer research. So as mentioned before, when we can grow healthy tissue, we can usually also grow cancer organoids. And one thing uh, that you can do, of course, is creating um, cancer organoid biobanks. And this was work done by Mark van der Wetering, and uh, I think he used here tumors from uh, around 20 patients. By now, this biobank has grown to, I think, close to 200. And what he did is um, he took samples from uh, colon cancer patients, both from the tumor and from normal tissue, and he ran them through a DNA sequencing, RNA sequencing, um, drug screening library, and then basically tried to uh, associate the mutational landscape with the um, reaction of these organoids to uh, different drugs. You can already see that the tumor organoids resemble the original tumor uh, very well. So this, uh, you can see in the lower panels here, you can see this uh, tumor P8 has a very dense uh, phenotype, both in the histology of the tumor and in the histology of the organoid. And the same is true for the other two tumors. So we usually see that um, the organoids very faithfully reflect the uh, the features of the original tumor. So when he did um, the sequencing and looked at the mutations, we basically found a, a typical uh, landscape for colorectal cancer, um, also very similar to what has been published in, in various cancer databases, so a lot of APC mutations. Um, interestingly, I think there was one or two of the lines that did not have um, APC mutations, but they actually had mutations in these E3 ligase that downregulates a uh, frizzle that I've shown you before. And that basically also causes hyperactivation of the wind signaling pathway. But at the same time, um, that also means that these cells are still dependent on having wind ligand around. So these, these tumors were then very susceptible to, for example, porcupine inhibitors, which stops wind secretion. And other examples here would be tumors that have intact P53 um, are still very susceptible to Nutlin3, which is basically um, activating the P53 response. And uh, tumors with still wild-type KRAS are um, very susceptible to uh, cetuximab. And yeah, so 
these are, uh, I would say, Im an important uh, proof of concept to show that with such a biobank, you can actually um, make a general conclusions about what mutational landscape will react to what kind of uh, uh, therapy. So um, this all started with a colon cancer biobank, but um, by now we also have biobanks from breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and, and pancreatic cancer, and this is um, continuously expanding. I told you the colon cancer now has, I think, around 200 samples in there. And this is, of course, not only interesting for um, drug development, of course, um, you can test your drugs on a huge panel of a living biobank, but it is also interesting in terms of personalized medicine. So basically, you can establish organoids from a tumor that usually goes fairly quickly, and you can des test various drugs on these organoids, and then decide basically which therapy strategy is likely to be the most beneficial one for the patient. Now, we can not only um, create biobanks from a tumor organoid, but we can actually go the other way to study cancer. So we take a healthy cell and turn it into a tumor cell. And this is work that was done by uh, Jano Drost here. And what he did is he used CRISPR-Cas9 to introduce known cancer mutations into a healthy organoid and basically looked at how, how are these cells changing and what really causes the um, cancer in the end. So uh, the setup here is fairly simple. We use CRISPR-Cas9 to introduce mutations in APC. As I mentioned before, when you mutate APC, you have continuously active wind signaling. So uh, you can easily select for that by um, withdrawing wind and responding and only um, organoids that actually have mutated APC will be able to grow out. Then, as a next step, he mutated uh, P53, a very important tumor suppressor, and he could easily select those by adding Nutlin 3 to the medium, so cells that still have intact P53 will actually die. And at this point, um, basically, uh, cells do not have P53 anymore and are only dependent on EGF and login uh, in the medium. Now, to remove the EGF dependence, he actually did a knock-in of a constitutively active um, KRAS. So this is a G12D mutation. Then he can withdraw EGF, and only cells will grow out that actually have constitutively, constitutively active um, KRAS. And then finally, to even remove the necessity of noggin, he mutated um, also SMAD4, the common SMAD, uh, which means there's no BMP signaling possible anymore, and then these cells can basically almost grow in plain medium. Now, when we look at the effects of these mutations um, on, on, on the lower panel, you can see an increased genetic instability, especially as soon as you mutate P53. To a certain extent, also when you mutate APC, you can see on the right side, there's an increased rate of aneuploidy. Um, <laughs> The instability increases even more with the KRAS um, activation, and then basically this metaphor doesn't do much on top of that. And the same can be true here with aneuploidy. Um, you can see the triple mutant is already very aneuploid, but also P53 and APC together, and you have like 60% of cells that are um, already uh, have an, uh, different number of uh, chromosomes. So then um, Jano also uh, transplanted these different um, tumor organoids. So what you can see here are four triple mutants, and uh, on the right side, a quadruple mutant. And these triple mutants, the way it is indicated, so if there's P53 wild type, it means it is an APC, um, KRAS, and SMAT4 mutation, but P53 um, is still wild type. And in this case, you see you get Small cysts, they are not very proliferative, so certainly uh, not cancer, not even an adenoma. Uh, the same is true if KRAS is still wild type, but the, others, uh, the other three genes are mutated. You have s uh, some 
uh, Kia 67 positive cells in there, but for sure it is not uh, very proliferative and, and certainly not invasive. Um, when just APC is wild type and the other three genes are mutated, um, you get also uh, relatively small cysts here, but when we have uh, mutated APC, mutated P53, and um, constitutively active KRAS, you can see we get much larger structures here, and this basically resembles an adenoma. Only when we have all four mutations at the same time, this is what you can see on the very right side, we actually see a carcinoma. You can see that these uh, tumor cells are invasive, and we can even find them, um, we can find metastasis from these cells in um, other tissues. So as you can see, this is a very interesting model to kind of look at the stepwise progression of cancer from a healthy cell to an uh, invasive carcinoma. Yeah, and uh, with that, I think um, it, I will just do a small summary of what we have been talking about. So first of all, adult epithelial stem cells can be grown into organotypic 3D structures. They're called organoids. Uh, in our case, these are epithelial structures. Um, organoids have a broad usage for disease modeling, especially for infectious diseases, but also for many, many genetic disorders. They can be employed for high throughput screens, for drug discovery, and, and maybe even most interesting for personalized medicine. They have a very high genetic stability, they have fast expansion rates, and they can be um, used in the context of genome editing, which makes them very interesting for regenerative medicine. And finally, cancer organoids or tumoroids, as some people call them, um, can be used to study cancer development on the one hand by the use of biobanks for drug discovery or personalized medicine, but also on the other hand to, to actually look at uh, cancer progression and what are the events that lead to uh, the formation of cancer. And with that, um, I only want to thank uh, many people. Um, the ones I listed here, Nick Barker, uh, Sina, Jano, Johan, Mary, Walter, Wim, Toshi, Gerald, Hu, and Mark are all people I showed you data from today. Um, but there are many, many more that are involved here in the Clavers lab, but also in other groups to um, improve organoid systems from all different kinds of tissues. So many thanks to all the current and former members of the Clavers lab. Of course, many uh, thanks to Hans for being at the center of this organoid knowledge hub. And many thanks to uh, my collaborators, Jeffrey Bakeman, who uh, does a lot of the cystic fibrosis work, um, Edwin Kuppen, who does a lot of sequencing for us, Jaco, who does a lot of in vivo imaging, but also uh, transplantations for us, and uh, Mamoru Watanabe, who was very important to establish this colon transplantation um, protocol. Yeah, and uh, with that, I want to thank uh, all of you for your attention, and if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer them. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Helmut, for that great talk. Uh, you guys have really uh, put together quite the body of, of research over the last number of years, really making a lot of, really making a lot of headway in, in driving the, the use of adult stem cells and organoid technologies. Um, so in the little bit of time we have left, I, I think uh, the operator said that there's nothing after us. So we do have a, a few minutes for questions, maybe, maybe five to ten minutes. Uh, so I'm just going to feed you some of the questions that some of our attendees have have entered into to our system here, and uh, we'll see see how this goes. Um, so the first question for you, Hema, uh, comes from Robert, and he wants to know, in your opinion, what are some of the major barriers that must be overcome to foster a more widespread adoption uh, for the use of, of organoids? Hmm, I see, yes. Um, I think this is uh, probably twofold. Uh, first, I would say the getting into organoids is, is quite a commitment. Um, it, is, it is certainly um, a technology that you have to establish well. Um, you have to make sure that, um, for example, all your medium components are working correctly. That, I would say, becomes easier and easier because there are basically ready-to-use um, 
media and so forth available. Um, but it is still, I would say, a certain barrier of entry. The second one is to actually get your material. So um, for researchers, I would say it is usually easier because we can, if we have a good um, collaboration uh, with, for example, um, um, a hospital close by, you can always get biopsies, tissue samples, and so forth. Um, but for companies and so forth, this can be more difficult. Um, for this reason, um, we actually set up at the Hubert Institute here the hub for organoids, which basically, on the one hand, um, acts as a biobank that can distribute different organoids to um, places all over the world, but most importantly, it also acts as an interface with uh, well, other academic groups, but also with uh, industrial partners that are interested in, in getting into um, organoid research. And they can then provide um, not only tissue, but also training and um, all the uh, tips that uh, you need to know to have a healthy organoid culture. So I think, yeah, it is the ease of access to material and ease of access to the, I would say, the factors that will guarantee that you have healthy organoids in terms of well-working media are the, the main barriers to, to get further into that. Thanks. Um, the next question we have here uh, wants to know, uh, are you aware of any example of any cartilage organoids that can more closely represent cartilage stratification other than the usual pellets or micromasses that are obtained using mesenchymal stem cell centrifugation and exposure to chondrogenic media? Mm -hmm. um, uh, unfortunately, I think this will be a relatively short answer because n no, I'm not aware of that. But um, at the same time, I have to say, um, we here are, are focusing on epithelial organoids. So all of our organoids so far are uh, pure epithelium. Um, what is, is done with other systems like IPS organoids and so forth, this you have, of course, um, a broader range of cells in there, but all our organoids um, are epithelial. So uh, cartilage, unfortunately, doesn't qualify there. So no, I'm sorry, I'm not aware of any other systems there. Right, okay. Um, another question we have is, uh, can you tell me if stem cells obtained from fetal tissue are suitable for organoid technology? Are there, is there any idea of special markers for this type of stem cells? Uh, and of course, if they would be suitable for, for organoid technology. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that's actually an interesting question. Um, the answer is definitely yes. So, in, in fact, what we see very often is that it is easier to grow fetal tissues. Um, we have higher proliferation rates, um, we have to split them more often, and so forth. Um, markers and so forth, that very much depends on, on which tissue you're looking at. Uh, however, the downside of that is, and that probably depends very much on um, the application that you have in mind, that you have to make sure that you will get then mature functional cells out of that, unless your interest is actually to looking into an, an fetal tissue type. But definitely, yes, fetal cells are 100% are suitable to grow um, organoids from. Excellent. Um, so moving along here. Um, Another question that, that came in was, most of the organoids that you show are usually small and only several days old. Is this strategic because of the difficulties that are usually encountered use, uh, in culturing larger organoids? Or, or, or is there some other reason for this? So uh, I would say it depends a little bit on uh, what, what type of organoid, which tissue. The reason for that is, so we usually um, split them, well, again, depends on the tissue, but something bet between seven and, and four, every seven to 14 days. Some cultures are faster, some cultures are slower. And if you don't do that, um, they do grow bigger. 
However, what you, what you will see is that you get more and more differentiation in the organoids. And so if, if you want to have optimal expansion, you actually have to split them relatively often. Um, otherwise, um, you may lose your culture eventually. I, I hope that answered the question. Was there? Uh, yes, no, I, I think yeah. that, that, that that should address that question. I, th I think that's really interesting. Uh, probably speaks maybe to to how well the, the niche is set up in maintaining those those stem cells, I guess, maybe. Yeah, in, in, in the case of intestinal organoids, the, the other problem is um, they continuously produce cells, but these cells also continuously die. So at some point, if you, if you just let them sit there, they sit in a cloud of dead cells, which is not right. ideal. Fair enough. <laughs> um, we have time for maybe just, just a couple of more questions. Um, so uh, another one that came in here uh, has to do, I guess, you, you talked a little bit about the use of organoids in pharmacological screening. And, and mm -hmm. the, the cystic fibrosis case is an excellent example of, of the power of organoids for personalized medicine and even, I guess, studying the efficacy of, of a given drug. Um, what if someone was interested in using organoids for, for more on the, maybe the discovery side of, of drug development? How, how scalable do you think this system is and, and how hard is it or how hard is it not, I guess, to, to meet the needs uh, of the amount of cells and organoids you would need for, for pharmacological screening? Hmm. Um, I think that's uh, it's kind of a common answer here, but it depends on the tissue because um, I would say the scaling up of the culture is different for different tissues. So, uh, for example, for the, for the liver, it, it is relatively easy because in, in the right conditions you can even grow them in suspension. Um, so, in principle, you could have a bioreactor full of them. Um, in the case of other organoids that depend more on having really a solid matrix, um, it is more difficult. But this, this is absolutely something we are, we are looking into and, and uh, working on uh, to, to figure out. And I would say, let me think, we, yeah, we have not been able to eliminate uh, Matricel for all of the cultures, but for many of them. And those that still need it, we can usually, at least for two, three passages, grow without problems in um, suspension, which makes the scaling up much easier. Um, since we're, we're just about out of time, uh, I'll ask just one more question, and it's a very general question, uh, sort of advice-seeking, I guess you could say. Um, the, the question goes that if I were a researcher who was thinking of, of just getting into organized technologies now for my research, uh, what kind of advice would you give me? What, what are some of the important factors that I should really consider before jumping into this field? So I think my, my main advice would be um, come here and get some training. Uh, actually, that, that is something that happens continuously. So almost every week we have, we have people here in the Clavers lab that are being trained in culturing one or the other organoid system. And it helps a lot. Um, I'm in contact with many people that, that, that struggle because one or the other thing is, is, is not working for them. Usually, uh, as I mentioned before, it is an issue of um, you know, not having a good enough condition medium or something like that. And the, the technology of itself is very robust. So when, when your components are um, good, then you are going to get organoids, and you're going to get good organoids. But it helps a lot if somebody can actually train you in how to plate them, how to split them, because most of the splitting is actually mechanical disruption. Um, and there it is a question of how big do you make the pieces? How dense do you seed them? And it is extremely helpful to have somebody that can practically show you how to do that. So my, my main advice would be contact us or somebody else that does it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you guys are at the center, so it, it makes, makes perfect sense. Um, so I, I think that just about does it for us. Um, so once again, uh, 
I, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Gerhardt, for, Gerhard, for, for taking the time to, to give us this presentation and, and share some of your thoughts and opinions uh, on organoids. And of course, I'd like to thank everyone who, who logged in and attended this, this fascinating seminar. So thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>